if you have your Bibles or your devices uh, this morning or whenever you're watching this program, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 and I'd like to read about the first 15 verses if you will follow along as I read from the NASB. 2 Kings chapter 2 reading from verse 1. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here please. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be still. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, Please stay here. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters and they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now it came about when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it came about as they were going along and talking that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them and Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elijah crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Shall we pray together? Our loving Heavenly Father, would you inspire us through the power of your Holy Spirit that these words written so many years ago and an event that happened so many years ago Lord, will find relevance for us today. So take it, Lord, and distill it, Lord, through our own understandings, our own culture, our, our own um, ideas, and our own situations and circumstances, so that this will be a relevant word for everybody who listens. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. What an incredible account, isn't it, of the closeness of a, a mentor and a mentee. Here were Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, that great man of God. When we think about Elijah, we know the things that James spoke about him in the New Testament too, that he was a man of prayer, great man. And yet, just like us, you and me, 
and yet God did incredible things through him. You remember we read, uh, we, we read in the Bible about that great encounter with the priests of Baal, uh, how he stood there and he, he challenged Israel, if the Lord is God, follow him. And this is the Elijah that Elisha is following. But he's following because he knows that this is the end of his mentor's career and he's not going anywhere. He wants to stick close to him and it seems as if Elijah wants to stop him because three times we see that he turns to him and he says, stay here please for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel there in Gilgal and Elijah says to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Bethel and then he says, no, I will not as the Lord lives. And as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they go on to Bethel and then they reach Bethel. And then Elijah says to him again, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And again, Elisha will have none of it. He says, no, I'm going with you. And so they make their way on to Jericho. They reach Jericho and then he turns to Elisha again and says, stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And again, Elisha says, I will not leave you. And so they reach the Jordan. But in the interim, in these two places at Bethel and then at Jericho, there are other prophets. And it seems like they also are kind of heaping on Elisha what's going to happen. Because they say to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? From over you, meaning that till now you've had his spiritual oversight. But from now on, you will not have it. God is taking away your master. What does Elisha say? Yes, I know. Be still. Be quiet. Don't talk about that. And twice this happens. And it's an interesting journey, isn't it? Elisha doggedly following after Elijah. Elisha telling Elisha, stop here. I've got to go from Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to Jordan. And each time Elisha saying, no. I'm coming with you. And then they finally reach the Jordan and he asks, Elijah then turns uh, to the Jordan and he takes his mantle and he strikes it. And then the Jordan opens and they walk through on dry ground. And when they reach the other side, Elijah turns to Elisha and he says, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Tell me. Ask me what you want before I'm taken from you. And Elisha says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah immediately responds and says, that's a very hard thing. Because he knows that it's not something that he can give. But I think he also knows that this is a pleasing request to God. And so he says, and I think this is prophetically, as he was a prophet, he says in verse 10, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if, you, if not, it shall not be so. And then he does see Elijah being taken from him. And then you can see the remorse, the sadness, the grief at this parting. He cries out and says, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. My father, my father. And then the end of Elijah's time on the earth. But as he is taken up, his mantle falls back to the earth. And Elisha picks up that mantle. He says in verse 13, he also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And then he took the mantle and he struck the waters and said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And immediately the same thing happened and he crossed back across the Jordan. And the sons of the prophets met him because they recognized that the anointing of God was now on Elisha. 
What a beautiful handing off of the baton, isn't it? And there are many motives that we can see from this story. The commitment of Elisha, the loyalty, the love that he had for his mentor. Not willing to listen to even people who are talking about, from now on you'll be alone, he won't be there, you won't have his cover. Hushing them. This is not the moment for that. I'm going with him. This is my last journey with the one that I have learned so much from. Then picking up the mantle and then knowing that the anointing of God is upon him. Because the same thing that Elijah did, Elisha was also able to do. Well, lest we look at this narrative and and lay it back there in the Old Testament and say that's a great story and an inspiring one. We need to be able to look at it through our own lenses. For the Bible is relevant from the beginning to end for each one of us in the situations that we face in, that we are facing and across all ages. The Bible stays relevant, beloved. So we must ask the question, what can we glean from these 15 verses that we ought to learn something from, that we can appropriate in our own lives? And so I want to give you a few points and I'm hoping that as I put them out that you'll begin to think about them and that the Holy Spirit will then come and do what only He can in taking the word and strategically making it fit our own situation and our own circumstances and our own lives. So, the first thing that I think we need to look at is that first verse. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven. God was saying to Elijah, your time is over. Your time on earth is over. I'm taking you up to heaven. And the point I'd like for us to kind of land on is this, that our days, beloved, are numbered. That there is a fixed number of days that we have here on earth. There's a time when a person's life work will be done. And then it's over. Job 14.5 says, A person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits that he or she cannot exceed. Job 14.5 Psalm 139, 16 says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Or we don't know how old Elijah was, that he was ailing or he was sick and so God was saying, okay, your time is... No, because it seems like he was quite well. He walked from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to, jo to, to Jericho. To Jordan, he walked. Nor was the anointing of the Lord, had the anointing gone because he was still able to do a miracle right there. God's Spirit was upon him. And yet, in seemingly what you and I would look at and say, he's quite fine to continue on. I'm sure there's still work to do. God decreed that it was time to take Elijah up to heaven. And it came to me as I was preparing the sermon that you and I too have a date when God will take us as well. When the days that God has 
ordained for us to be here will be done. And it may not be when we are old and unable to do much. It could be when everybody looks at us and says, my goodness, they're in their, we're in their heyday. God has a specific time when he says, that's the time given to you and me. And sometimes God takes people away at the height of their effectiveness. Look at the New Testament, James, the son of Zebedee. Hardly had a ministry, isn't it, before he was beheaded. And he was one of the inner circle. And you ask the question, how is it? These Peter, James and John were the closest. And yet, Peter survived for some more time. James lost his head. Was that all? And it seems, yes, that that was the only time that James was given. What about Stephen? The Bible tells us so much about Stephen, isn't it? That he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit, that he had the ability to articulate and point people through Scripture to Jesus the Messiah. That nobody could argue against him. And yet, snuffed out, stoned to death. All of us, beloved, we all have a set time in this world. And we must use it well and fruitfully. Jesus himself said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. The night cometh. When no man can work. So that's the first point that I'd like to just place before us. That you and I understand that we have a start date and an end date that is already set. And during that time, we need to be able to do all that God in his infinite wisdom knows and knew that we could do and become and speak and act and all of those things to fit into that lifetime. Secondly, secondly, I think that when we think about Elijah asking Elisha and saying, ask, ask of me, what can I do for you? I think that it was such an open-ended question. It, it didn't say, ask of me all that I have, what you want from me. No. Ask what you will. And it's like that's the way that God opens up his arms to us. That he is God. And he invites us to ask things of him. Boldly without any boundaries except that he says ask in the things that are in accordance with my will and so as children of his sons and daughters who follow after him we ought to be walking in his will and asking him for the the, the things that are huge We can ask with boldness to one who can give. Just as e Elisha asked. And we look at it and we think, my goodness, what, he was a really a greedy person. I wanted more fame than Elijah. I want a double portion. Of... No, no. What Elisha was really asking was to be like, to, like a son of Elijah. Because the double portion was always given to the heir, was given to the firstborn. And Elijah had no children. And when he was asking for a double portion, he was saying, if I'm your heir, then I will get a double portion. Beloved, 
As we look at the Bible and we see people who have asked of God, Solomon asked of God for wisdom and God gave him incredible wisdom. Remember Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? I want to regain my sight. I wonder whether you and I have become just a little careful, beloved, in the things we ask of God. That we ask of Him things that we know He can give in the sense of giving according to our finite understanding. And so maybe our asking of Him is safe. We ask for, just give me a little peace or bless my life. Instead of asking with boldness of our Heavenly Father. So, as we serve God, to be able to ask Him for anything, to go to Him with boldness about the things that we need. Thirdly, to remember that what people around us cannot give or cannot do, God can. As Elisha asked for a double portion, Elijah knew that he couldn't give that because the anointing of God's Spirit comes from God. And so, what we cannot give ourselves or cannot do ourselves, we need to remember that God can. What are things that we cannot do for ourselves? Well, sometimes we want things that people cannot give, isn't it? Like maybe salvation for a loved one. I can't do that. I can't save somebody. But God can. And so I go to Him and I say, Lord, would you bring salvation to this person? Or maybe it's freedom from addiction or sin that you cannot in any way help somebody. You've tried, but you know that God can. So we invite God to come and do it. Or maybe it's reconciliation in somebody's marriage. Or maybe it's asking for a, a child. A couple asking for a child. For you and me to be able to go to God and say, Lord, would you grant this wish? Maybe even looking for a spouse. What we cannot physically do, beloved God can. And so not to limit the things that we can do by the things that are in our power. But realize that when we cannot do something ourselves, that an infinitely powerful God can do. And so to be able to take those things to Him as well. Fourthly, and this is a maybe a personal one for many. Just to ask the question, have you picked up the mantle? Have you picked up the mantle? Elisha picked up the mantle as Elijah was taken assumed that now this was his role, the role that he had to play. And I don't know whether you are in a mentor-mentee relationship, whether you have somebody that you're learning from, following somebody who's teaching you. And I wonder whether it is time for you to step out. Whether God is saying, this is over. I now want you to start doing this part that is entirely 
yours. And it's a timing issue, isn't it? Just as Jesus, when he heard that John had been beheaded, began then to open up his ministry. And maybe you've been accumulating knowledge and studying and preparing and waiting for that time. And I wonder whether the mantle has fallen. And it's right there. I wonder whether God is saying, pick it up. It's for you. It's time. It's time for you to start being your own person. You're coming out of the shadow of your mentor. And you're going to be walking now under the anointing and power of my spirit by yourself. But also, when we look at this passage, to recognize that there may be well-meaning people telling you that you're going to be alone, that you won't have somebody to go to, and all kinds of things that may discourage you and whether it's time to tell or hush those voices and say, be still. I've heard the Lord, I'm picking up the mantle. It's time. And then this final bit. I love this question. Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? You no, know, beloved, we. Look at people whom God has used extensively. We see how God has used them in powerful ways. And as Elisha stood there with the mantle in his hand and he hit the Jordan again, said, where is the God of Elijah? The God of Elijah answered. And in that answer and in doing what needed to happen proved that he is also the God of Elisha. The same thing that happened to Elijah happened to Elisha with the parting of the Jordan for him to walk through. You know, when we pick up the mantle, there's a moment of concern. Is this right? Am I taking the right step? Is this the time? There's doubt always, beloved. But it's also a moment of faith. And I believe it's that faith that puts God's stamp of approval on our lives as we take the mantle and go forth to do His will and His bidding. What was that moment of faith? We look at verse 13. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Notice that he first struck the waters. First, he was already committed to doing what he had to do and then expecting God to come through. Beloved, I've always said this, that an integral part of faith is doubt. Faith is overcoming that doubt. And as you and I stand on the edge, holding the mantle and saying, is this my time? I wonder whether God is saying to you, take that first step of faith. Take that first step of faith and you will find that I'm right there. Where is the God of Elijah? The God of Elijah will be right there with you and with me. Beloved, what a time it is for more 
men and women to be picking up the mantle and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm ready to do your bidding. For we know, isn't it, beloved, that today the world needs men and women who will go on. The world needs ones who will respond to be pastors and teachers in the church. The world needs pastors. We need ones who will shepherd the flock who will lead sheep. Beloved, there's such a, a dire need. Somehow it seems that in the last 10 to 15 years, <clears throat> there's been a shift from saying, I answer the call of God on my life from the point of it being going into full-time ministry, maybe going into a seminary and then coming out as a pastor, taking a church or starting a church, whatever, but being willing to lead a group of people and shepherding those people, teaching them. Because the Bible says that we need to make disciples, which is not just to save them, but to continue to input into them until they are disciples. Somehow, it seems that the focus has moved away from that kind of quote-unquote, full-time ministry to a belief that says that everybody is in ministry. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you're in your work, you're in ministry. And hear me, I agree. But I'm also saying that there is a need for men and women to follow into the church and be willing to pastor people. To be shepherds. For the need is great. Beloved. The mantle needs to be picked up. And. You need to take that step. Of faith. To be able to realize. That the God. Of Elijah. And Elisha. And all the saints who have gone through the ages is with you as well. Willing to lead you, guide you, sustain you, anoint you, empower you to do everything that he wants you to do. I would submit to you today that for all the things that maybe we can look at, I would say to you, our time on earth is finite. There are bookends on either end. And in between, maybe now, there's a mantle that needs to be picked up. Because there is a work that needs to be done. The question for you and me is will we pick up that mantle so that God's work continues to be done here on earth in the days that we have. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to number our days, to know, Lord, that we have a limited number of days on this earth and that you have placed us here for a noble mission, Lord, in perfect accordance with your will. Help us, Lord, to walk in it. But even beyond that, Master, if there's a stirring of people's hearts today, if there are some in different homes who are looking at the ground and saying the mantle is there before me and I'm scared, I'm, I'm not sure. Lord, would you let faith arise? Lord, would you let them move under the power of your spirit? Would you let them know you will lead them? Help them to pick up the mantle, Master, and to be able to follow you so that your work continues to 
should be done. To think big, to ask big, and to allow every dream that you have for people here on earth to be fulfilled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.